Hi, everybody. This is Dr. Gadir, and thank you for joining us for another episode of The Fertile Life. I am very excited to talk to one of my favorite dermatologists, Dr. Z, Dr. Zena, Dr. Zenovia, Dr. So Many Things. Um, she's the best. She has an unbelievable practice that actually looks at things that I look at as well, which are hormone levels. And we're really excited to have her back here. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Your doll, thank you for having me. I can't tell you how much I was looking forward to having this meeting. This is our second date, so it's going to be fun. I know. It's wonderful. It's wonderful. So thank you for being here. Um, I did want to give you the opportunity to kind of introduce yourself because I never can do it as well as my guests do. And I think it's a perfect opportunity to kind of just let everyone know what we're going to be talking about by introducing yourself. You're so sweet. Okay. So, um, my name is Dr. Zinovia Gabriel. I am a board certified dermatologist. I run a bread and butter comprehensive dermatology clinic in Newport Beach, California, which is the Southern part of California. And um, I've got two kids, I'm a busy mom. Um, I do the full spectrum of dermatology from, you know, autoimmune bullous disease on up to, you know, lasers, injectables and cosmetic medicine. Uh, but one of my uh, kind of flavors or things that I've enjoyed developing is kind of the concept of hormonal dermatology. And, and just the idea that I think is misunderstood is how hormones impact the skin. I don't claim to be an endocrinologist. I am a, you know, I'm, you know, solid skin expert, dermatology trained. Um, but I just, I've always found interest in how hormones have impacted um, the skin and how we don't understand that. And I launched a skincare line about a year ago, in fact, exactly a year ago yesterday. Called wow, Dr. congratulations. Zenovia. Thank you. It's been a wild ride. And so it's been fun, but busy. And the whole line is kind of based on how to support the skin hormonally and not just the basic tenets of dermatology. So that's it. That's just it. That's all she does. Just a little something on the side. Um, <laughs> exactly. So that's like, that's enough to take like a team of like 12 people to be doing full time and you still not what? being able to. And she just says, that's it. Well, <laughs> that's why we love you. Um, you know, I, I, I want to start by saying, I don't think that people really give enough attention to why there are skin issues. So skin issues can be superficial. And I think, you know, from something superficial on the skin, but I think there's so much behind it. And I think truly as a reproductive endocrinologist, someone who is adjusting, adding, removing, um, altering female levels of hormones to make sure that reproduction is very in its optimal way, you know, we notice that those things really affect people and they really affect people. And one of the first manifestations, um, other than making eggs and producing eggs and changing and affecting quality of eggs is the skin. And with that, we can tell that there is a lot going on behind the scenes. You know, let me ask you a, a, a starter question. When someone comes to you and says, I, I don't know what's going on. My skin is in horrible condition right now. What is the first thing that makes you think that it potentially is hormonal? I mean, as all things medicine, Shaheen, everything requires uh, an excellent history from the patient. Are there exacerbators of their skin condition? Is it uh, cyclical? You know, that's one thing. Um, also, just a, a physical exam. I mean, you know, I think it takes doctors about 10 years to get really trained on the nuances of the physical exam. So when I inspect your skin, I'm looking at it under the microscope. I look at the dehydration level. I look at, you know, if we're talking about acne, for example, I look at, do you have, are all your pimples in the same phase? Are they not in the same phase? Are they all cystic? Are they comedonal? I mean, there's so many nuances to the details of your skin morphology. You know, it's like, I look in the microscope and then I look at the macro and I look at like the whole picture. And so um, um, hormones in general always cross my mind. But so does immunology. I mean, the skin is the largest immune organ, okay? It's, it's the barrier to the outside world. So it's all those things that come together for me, not just hormones, but hormones are always on my mind. So it's so interesting that you brought up the word immune because one of, so I have had a great relationship in the past with my um, local rheumatology team that yeah. affects huge. so many ways. Huge. So, huge. 
I mean, let's give a shout out to the rheumatologists out there. Room I, I don't think they get enough credit. Oh my gosh, room. And, and for me, I'm very close to my allergy immunologist. I, I was going to say oh. in the last year, with the word you say at the immunologist. So I've reached out to a couple local immunologists that I've known for a really long time. And I said, you know, I think I'm going to need you to get a little bit more involved. Sometimes we put these perfect, perfect embryos with a gorgeous uterus and it's a negative pregnancy test. And that kills me. It's like, it. it's the root of like everything that I hate about my yeah. career is that. And there's things that happen, I think, in people's lives that the immunological factors that you're not aware of what is going on in your life, uh -huh. along with the rheumatologic, and, and all of these are these underlying secret levels that people, the average layperson, know nothing about. Or, I've said the or word. the average doctor can't even see. Uh, 100%. It's not like it's creating a disease in you. I mean, there's a lot of rheumatologic, occult, kind of connective tissue disease whispers in your body that you can't catch on serum levels or you cannot catch with a patch test. And the, the body's just this like crazy bioactive organ. So what, what, what probably blows your mind as equally as mine is a therapy that I'm like, oh my gosh, this should totally work. And then it doesn't. What is that thing? And I do think a so lot of true. it is our immune system. I think so too. And I think um, we have a certain amount of control of our immune system, actually probably more than we think, but yeah. we don't do enough to make it optimized. So this, the consultations and second opinions that I've been getting from my rheumatology yeah. colleagues, my immunology colleagues, allergy colleagues. I think a lot of this whole idea of inflammation in the body has yes. a tremendous amount to do with your hormones, totally. with your skin, with yes. implantation, with fertility. And it's really, really underestimated and ignored in too many ways. Well, like I'll just give you like a couple of like kind of solid patient examples that are, that blow my mind. It's like, I have some people who live with like occult rosacea. Okay, rosacea is like inflammation of the sebaceous gland. I tell people it's not adult acne. That's the wrong nomenclature. Rosacea is a, I call it kind of an autoimmunity to the oil gland. So you can get dilated blood vessels, pustules, sensitivity, reactive skin. And it's a spectrum. You can get like pizza face acne with it all the way down to rosy cheeks. Not everybody's the same. And I swear, it's like when people are stressed in their lives or they have like immunologic kind of hiccups, their rosacea gets worse. So it's all connected to the immune system. And like, you know, for, you know, and I'm sure you see that all the time. The problem is I can't put my finger on it. It's not like a lab value. It's just a milieu or like a cocktail of inflammatory mediators that are influenced by your behavior in the daily world, your stress, your diet your exposure to the sun. Those are like external factors affecting your immunology. One thing I want to point out what I thought was so awesome, which you just said, is you said there's a certain amount of control we have in our immune system and a lot that we don't. For example, I'm sure you get the question all the time. I get it all the time. Dr. Z, why am I getting this and I never got it before? And I'm like, well, you know, we evolve as people, we change as people. Our immune system is changing, our biology is changing, our microbiome is changing. So what happened to you five years ago is not what's gonna happen to you now. So we're this like evolving organic thing moving through time and space. And I tell everyone, all the disease that happens in your body, whatever the disease is, uh, in myocardial infarction, multiple sclerosis, acne, uh, cancer, anything, your immune system is allowing it to happen. Yeah, that's Either. why we need to be as healthy as we can be. And that's exactly. why you need to do things. And, you know, you said all those things that I, I, the one word I was missing that I know you always talk about too is sleep. And I know that that has so much to do. And I'm so glad in this day and age, people are addressing it more and actually sure. people are bringing it up. I just think it's impossible to have a healthy life. And I got to tell you, I realized this over the last year when my clinic during, you know, last year, the heat of the pandemic was basically closed and I was showing up for like an hour a day to just make sure the building didn't burn down. Yeah. You know, <laughs> I realized sleep was unbelievable. Like yeah. the fact that I was actually sleeping more than I normally do. And yeah. I never felt so good. And I heard that from so many people. And yeah. I think it shows in your skin. I think it shows in every oh. single other way yes. that you manifest anything. And like 
think about how stressed we are now. It's like, not only are we like, you know, connected to this even during our sleep, but it's like the amount of stress in modern life is so incredible. Even teenagers can't sleep anymore. There's so much anxiety and stress and teenagers we know sleep for like 12, 14, 15 hours. I mean, it, it's sad to see how stressed we are as modern humans and how the one restorative biologically necessary thing besides excretion and respiration is sleep. And 100% I'm glad people are actually mentioning it because it does impact your sleep. Um, it does impact your skin tremendously. Stress, the thing about the skin is hormones impact the skin. Your nervous system impacts the skin and I'm sure it impacts your uterus too at your ovulatory cycle. I mean, the nervous system, think about cortisol and stress and all the things that happen to a woman when she's trying to get pregnant. Is it like a rule of thumb for pregnancy? Adopt a kid, you'll get pregnant in a month. It's like, you know, people get pregnant right after they adopt a kid and they were trying 10 years before. Once you release that stress and you're not trying to get pregnant, it kind of happens. Do you see that in your, in your patients? You know, I see it all the time. I had a yeah. patient and I'll never forget her. Um, she actually, we were on the verge of going to an egg donor. Yeah. Because nothing had worked. She had failed multiple cycles. She was a big time producer in Hollywood, so much stress. And she went to an island in the Caribbean. And when she came back ready to start the egg freezing process, guess what? She was she, pregnant. Exactly. Exactly. Um, and she had another let kid after that too. And, and she had to let it go. Yeah. As soon as you told her, okay, we're going to go with the second route. As soon as she wasn't worried about getting pregnant anymore, it happens. She it's had amazing. two kids, that one and another one as soon as she had delivered. And it was unbelievable. So it goes to tell you that stress and the, the hormone involved with stress, cortisol are really bad. I mean, oh. we know that excessive le levels of cortisol can like destroy your skin. Um, but those are things that I think are really, really bad, really bad. Mm -hmm. But let's get to some the roots of some things that my patients are talking about. Like, okay. I'd love for you to start going through some of your basics for keeping your skin as good as possible. Because Okay, we know that we can kind of balance hormones and try to control hormones. So this this is an effect. But what are some things that just the average person, if I just wanted to come and say, I want better skin, you recommend? Because I know everyone, everyone, I have so many guy friends that tell me, what do you do? I, I, you have good skin. I just want to like, the yeah. other day I went to dinner and the wife of my friend, he's sitting right in front of me. She's sitting next to me. Please tell him what you do to your skin. Because oh look at his skin and look at yours. And I was like, yeah. okay. <laughs> That's funny. Well, I mean, there are some basics and these aren't things that like, you know, Dr. Z just believes these are kind of research proven things. First of all, just to go down to basics, you need sleep, exercise and water. I mean, that is like basic, basic. Everybody needs to be hydrated. The skin is a collagen sponge. And so you need hydration. Nice job. Um, and here's mine. Ding. Cheers. Clink, clink. Cheers. Cheers. Um, number one. And two, we talked about sleep, uh, restorative, um, allowing your skin to kind of recycle those enzymes and, and restore and reset itself. And then the third is exercise. When you exercise, you get a decrease of stress, but also you get vasodilation and that causes greater circulation to the skin. But as far as topicals and the things that we know in the field of dermatology, hands down, we know that ultraviolet light damages collagen and causes skin cancer. Period. Numero uno, you need a good sunscreen. And I believe in physical blockers. I don't care if, you, and it's not like your kids in the pool and that's who needs sunscreen. I'm talking about every day um, you go and you take your shower in the morning, brush your teeth. You need a moisturizer with a sunscreen. Even dudes should do this. Okay. And it's just, it doesn't have to be cakey white. They make them micronized now. They're, so, they're invisible. And so um, I recommend sunscreen on a board. That's number one. Number two, kind of pretty proven is um, antioxidants in the morning, as we all know, inflammation is kind of the source of all disease and the source of aging. We believe in antioxidants in the morning. Antioxidants are all over the map. Which ones do I like? I have a couple favorites, but I love vitamin C in the morning. I love, um, you know, basically a morning antioxidant picks up Shaheen, those free radicals that you're creating from sun exposure that your sun block didn't cover. So it's another, way to absorb ultraviolet radiation. And then at the end of the day, I do believe in glycolics and retinols. Those are kind of the, the ingredients, antioxidants in the morning with sunscreen, glycolics and retinols at night. And so you can find like the Dr. Zeno line that was like the tenants of my whole um, operation. 
glycolic acid wipe at night with advanced retinal night repair. Those are my two. Now, everyone's like, what about moisturizing? What about serums? What about toners? All that stuff is marketing. All that stuff is icing on the cake. The research proven dermatology backed ingredients that impact collagen content, elasticity, hormonal regulation is antioxidant sunscreen, retinol and glycolics at night. It's so Ooh. simple. Which sunscreen is with antioxidants? Because I'm so sorry. I like, I went to Costco and bought all this Neutrogena <laughs> stuff. And of course, six months later, there was a recall because it had benzene in it. Yes, okay? exactly. So, so first thing. And my kid said to me, you're trying to kill us. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's funny because not all sunscreens are made the same. In fact, there's a huge like marketing kind of fraud going on. There's like, you know, you see SPF 100 as if that blocks the sun 100% of the time. Not true. Um, basically an SPF of 30 blocks 98% of the rays. So above a 30, you ain't getting anywhere, okay? You only need a 30. And really you only need a 15 because a 15, SPF of 15 blocks 92% of the rays. So from 15 to 30, even though you're doubling the number, you're only going up 8%. Americans are typically, you know, difficult to understand this, but arithmetic is not arithmetic in science. So at the end of the day, I recommend a physical blocker, not the benzophenones that you got, but if you, tr if you take a bottle and turn it around, it should say zinc or titanium dioxide. And those are the two physical blockers. And they're safe in children, they're safe in adults, they're, they make a micronized, they're not nanoparticles, so they don't get in your uh, bone marrow that's been um, looked at by the FDA. So it, it's absolutely necessary. Now you ask the key question, which antioxidant goes in? There's a problem with antioxidants. Antioxidants are very unstable in an oxygenated atmosphere. So if you have like a bottle of vitamin C and you open it, it oxidizes, it's like unstable. Half of the vitamin C's out there or the pomegranates or the vitamin E's or whatever the heck you're using, destabilize either in the bottle because you didn't connect them with a good vehicle. I mean, there's a whole world of like bottle chemistry here or they oxidize when you open the bottle. So I typically don't mix in the product my antioxidant with my vitamin, with my sunscreen. It's usually a separate product because the chemistry behind that is, is pretty important. So one of my very good friends who's an ER doctor got me this, I think it's the brand ASOAP. And it yep, would set on an antioxidant that. serum. Okay, love it. So first of all, it's amazing. But I've been putting it on when I remember at nighttime, not in the morning. Uh, okay. But it has a little greasy feel to it. Interesting. Okay, y you could put it on it in the evening. But I'll tell you honestly, if you're going to get more bang for your buck and better work out of it, if you do it in the morning and mix it with a little bit of moisturizer, or maybe to decrease that like grease feel, spritz your face with a little bit of water and see if it gets absorbed. Sometimes, Shaheen, when you put on a serum and your skin is not moist, the serum just floats on top and it just, you feel like the product on top of your skin. But if you spritz it, your skin will drink that serum. So, so I, you, that's you, so important. Okay, so okay. someone years ago, I learned that you water is the best moisturizer in the world. Love when it. You shower, don't like just let it sit on you for a little bit to get absorbed by your body. You got it, baby. So and my, guess what? I, that's it. That that's and you that's so the it's the, my so people ask me all the time. I've been very very blessed. I'm turning 50 next month, and I've been blessed with thank God good skin my whole life. Um, my grandma passed away at 97, and she had no wrinkles. Wow, you look, I can tell your skin is absolutely gorgeous. I can Thank see Thank you, it. as yours yeah. is. But um, this has been, so I like to take a warm shower at night before I go to bed. And afterwards is when I put on a little, so I hate the free, the feeling of a lotion or something greasy on me. I've always hated that my yeah. entire life. Yeah. It, you um, almost feel dirty, right? Yeah, I, I just feel like, I feel like I just went to the beach and there's like sand stuck to my upper lip. And that's not how I feel like after I put like something greasy on. Um, and I've so always had dryer. Oh, so, so you put all your creams on at night? No, 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 no. For the last like 20 years, I've used the same thing. It's okay. lab series. It says age defying, whatever. It's like I love this it. 
very, okay. very light, has no greasiness yeah. to it, yeah. no scent to it. I put a little here, a little here, and now I put a drop on my forehead too. Yeah. And I just rub it in the morning yeah. and then I put, put it at night. But if I just took a shower, like I try to use something a little bit better at night, like that antioxidant thing, or I have yeah. some yeah. different moisturizers that like here and there, but keep it super simple. I'm like not yeah. into a million different things because I just totally. don't know how and I don't have the time and I forget and I've wasted a lot of money. For sure. And that, and I gotta be honest with you, most men and even most women, I mean, this is the other thing that's huge. And I know it is in your practice is compliance. Like I can sit there and be like, step one, step two, step three, step eight. No, one's going to do it. No one has the time. Okay. Like there might be some people who are like skin obsessed and put 14 layers of crap on their face morning and night. Dude, I am like so busy at night. You're like, like after brushing my teeth, you're lucky if I put anything on my face after my shower and brushing my teeth. Those are my two got tos because I'm so exhausted at the end of the day and I'm putting kids to bed. I'm cleaning up the kitchen just like all parents are. So yep. at the end of the day, I and like I, I hear some women who are like, oh, doctor, I'm so tired. I can't do anything. I'm like, you know what? Fine. We'll put everything on in the morning. And people are like, can you use Retin-A at night? I'm like, who cares? At least you're putting it on. Let's say it's 50% destabilized in the sun. At least you're getting that 50 and you're not using it never. Right. So the answer is, I bet you, Shaheen, your skin is gorgeous because your genetics are there. Plain and simple. It's not the ASOP. It's not the lab series, whatever. You've got good genes. So do I. But I can tell you in my genes, I get these melasma patches, as you've seen in your pregnant pages. And, and the patients who get melasma, it's hormonal and it is genetic. And in the summer, I, I cover up like an old lady with white toothpaste, sunscreen, a hat. I'm a dermatologist for Christ's sake. Of course I do that. But it doesn't matter. I still get melasma. And I spend September to December kind of cleaning it up. And I use glycolic, retinols, vitamin C, maybe a laser or two. And that's just the nature of knowing your skin and managing it and kind of learning who you are and what your skin needs. Okay, so... Um... This summer, for the first time, when we were like dead and we needed a vacation, we yeah. went to Mexico for like four or five days, and then a few weeks later, went to the Bahamas for like 10 days. Oh, you got a lot of sun. I like it. I came back. My cousins, I was with my kids and my wife and my cousin and their kids, and we have a picture that we no longer look Caucasian. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. My cousin said it was something between like Southeast India and Pakistani. I don't remember what it was. And there's so many beautiful people. I took it as a huge compliment, but I didn't even recognize myself anymore. Yeah, like no, I've no. never been so dark before in my entire life. And I now have noticed a lot of damage because of that. This really? Summer. I love it. You're kidding me. Like, yeah. give me an example. I just see like little, little, little lines all over my forehead that are so yeah. tiny yeah. that I'm like extra antioxidant over here and here. Oh my God. You're so cute. I can't stand it. Okay. You know what? That is so funny. I love your honesty and you're right. Even like a summer of sun damage can like age your skin. Totally true. I'm, and you know what I would do like, okay, those little tiny thin, thin lines, you know, you probably have, I'll, I'll tell you under the microscope what it looks like. Cause I do my own path, Shaheen. It's called solar elastosis. And when you look under the epidermis, your collagen fibrils got disturbed and there's like little spaces anymore. And they're not these dense collagen fibrils stuck together. There's like space in there. And that causes that dehydrated little like hyper linear look. And so one of the things that you can do just procedure wise is in, aside from the vitamin C, remember the vitamin C or the antioxidant that you're using is really not repairing anything or fixing anything. It's preventing new damage. Wait, wait. So let's just jump on this vitamin C. You've said it quite a few times. Like yeah. I'm imagining the white capsule that's 500 milligrams that I swallow in the morning. And I, okay. I cannot imagine a vitamin C that I'm rubbing on my forehead. So Good please question. explain. Okay, but I love it. You're a scientist at heart. Okay, the vitamin C capsule that you swallow is ascorbic acid. It is a molecule that is an acid. As you remember, acids have an OH group on the end, right? Okay, now you can take ascorbic acid and you chop it up chemically and you can make an esterase out of it. You can make a, an aldehyde out of it and you make ascorbic acid into different forms, but it's still got the antioxidant qualities, which allow it to like soak up free radicals from the environment. So essentially 
there are, believe it or not, some topicals that are pure ascorbic acid. And you know what it feels like on your skin? Acidic. It burns, it stings, it tingles. So the vitamin C's that are on the market, I'm actually launching um, a, a brighter line that's coming out. The line that I have so far is called the Clear Complexion Line. And it's, it's basically targeting acne. And it doesn't have a vitamin C in it, but it does have a vitamin C moisturizer. But the long and the short of it is there's three to four really active, stable, cutaneous vitamin C's that are on the market. They're expensive to make. And they do, again, have to be absorbed. You can't just have a huge molecule that sits on your skin and does anything. So ascorbic acid that you swallow is, is the same but converted to an absorbable topical ascorbic acid. Okay, so we can we people should be looking for your new vitamin C skin yes. product, and if not by then, they can look it up. And there's a few out there. Okay, so I'm yes. now understand it's something that's like applied to the skin. Okay, yes. I, I, this is like the first podcast I've done that I've taken so many notes. I'm just trying to look back at I what I it. even wrote here because I'm overwhelmed with information that I should have known and put in the back of my head that I never had the time to. Well, the other thing I'm wondering, you give a ton of progesterone for your um, uh, you know, patients on fertility. Progesterone is one of the main drugs that you administer. Do you see more acne? I mean, as we know, dermatologists, when you look at OCPs and you're prescribing oral contraceptives, they typically have to be lower in the progestin category be in order for them to work, just as the uh, Yaz and, and Drosperidone, the low right. Drosperidone. So what do if you someone really wants to use a specific one that they found that works well for them, we tell them to use that birth control. Generally speaking, when we start an IVF cycle, we put someone on a birth control for a week or two to stop their natural ovulation pattern and allow us to take over with the injections. So that's a really important thing. The ones that we give that we yeah. recommend is one that has a very, very low male hormone content. Yep, so the it, the mm -hmm. and, yes, exactly. So androgens are male hormones for people that are listening. And those are the ones we have a very low androgen profile birth control pill, also called oral contraceptive pill or OCP, as we're chatting along and saying our little jargon. I know. Um, so I those are the things that we give and it really has very, very little effects. However, many of my patients by being on high levels of estrogen that their body produces as a result and doing other things um, have had acne issues during this process. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of times I do see over time, like as they are, I'm following them towards their like ninth and 10th week of pregnancy that it usually gets resolved. But I have some, seen some people really break out. The progesterone itself, because we do give progesterone injections and also vaginal suppositories, I haven't noticed the true correlation with it, but usually that leads to someone becoming pregnant. And I think the overall pregnancy milieu of all your hormones that are completely out of whack and things you're not used to occasionally does cause some big issues there. Got it. So people that like in general, the people that you see that kind of get a hormonal breakout during that process, are they people who had a history of acne usually? Um, you know, it's, it's people erratic. that probably were the ones that during their menstrual cycles or right before their menstrual cycles were the ones that really broke out. Um, yeah. You know, as we know, like, the, you know, lots of people just have hormonal, which is more, most likely cyclic, most likely yeah. related directly to the menstrual cycle. Um, and with age, I noticed that most of those patients get better and better, but uh -huh. many people, it just kind of continues for them. And those are the people with the adult acne. So, so you just mentioned that there are also like a high dose estrogen that is part of that like IVF cycle. And that's so huge. I mean, is that true? Is there a high? So it's there... not that we're giving anyone estrogen, but the pituitary gland stimulant medications, the yeah. LH and FSH injections. So those injections that we're giving patients are called either gonalep or folistim or menopure. They actually trigger the pituitary gland in the brain, which then gives a signal to your own ovary. The ovary produces its own estrogen. We're never right. giving you an estrogen shot. And that's right. when people are like, am I going to get breast cancer? I'm like, no. No. no studies have ever shown links with cancer, but your own body is going to produce its own estrogen, which is the fuel to make a lot of eggs. Lots of estrogen in someone's body kind of mimicking the first half of the menstrual cycle can cause some people to get, uh, you know, some acne. And at the same time, make some people feel fantastic and energetic and looking great. And looking great. Well, I, my correlation with estrogen in the skin is kind of very, very uh, concrete and it correlates very closely. And that is 
the higher estrogen content in your skin that you have, the more collagen production you have. So just looking at the skin in terms of aging, Shaheen, when, um, as we become perimenopausal and premenopausal and even menopausal, when our estrogen levels kind of trough and go down, people start to look older. So it is very correlated to your estrogen levels and kind of the laxity of the skin and the collagen content. So forget about acne and hormonal acne, just aging alone is very related to estrogen. And, um, and just, just to kind of point out, one of the key things that I noticed and why I was so interested in hormones was, okay, we can't be giving women estrogen, just like you said, we're not causing cancer. We can't give estrogen supplements as a beauty pill, but this was kind of my inspiration, um, you know, creating the Xenovia line was how can I create like a, almost like a topical estrogen effect and you'll get a kick out of this. The idea was from, I was at a dermatology conference and one of my favorite um, lecture series is they have doctors all over the world and it's called surgical or derm pearls. And you have these random doctors, not these academics on the podium, just come up and give a 10 minute pearl about their practice. And I remember this one guy from like Ontario said, oh, I put vaginal estrogen cream on my patients as lower eyelid wrinkling. And his before and afters were amazing. I was like a resident at the time. I'm like, what? He's putting vaginal estrogen cream on the lower eyelids. And I, I got the idea. It was like that, you know, Steve Jobs shower moment. I'm like, I wonder if you can put estrogen topically and make people's skin better. And then 15 years later at a residency, you know, being a clinician, I was like, and I found a plant-based estrogen called Genstein. They use it in Italy all the time. And it's, a, it's, a, it's like a soybean derivative. And they take it orally for beauty in Europe. And I decided to refine it and package it. And so every one of my products has the plant-based phytoestrogen. It does not, it mimics human estrogen, but it's not. So it doesn't stimulate the estrogen receptors in the body. And it just gives you that local support of estrogen. That's, that's amazing. The, that's the basis of the whole line. Well, that's amazing. And it goes hand in hand with the same reasons that gynecologists, why we give vaginal estrogen to make the, the vagina during the perimenopause and the menopausal years a little bit more rejuvenated and not as dry exactly. and back to normal. So that is so intuitive. And that's amazing. Bravo. Yeah. This Ontario guy just was like, he pulled it out of his shed and like, his, and like, you know, you never, I never saw him again. His name is not famous. He just did it on the side. You know, there are these amazing community docs who have tricks in their black bag and nobody ever hears about them. So it was cool. And, um, you know, I don't know what's going to come of ACOG in the next 10, 15 years. And if we're going to be, become more liberal with estrogen supplementation, I think we're still, you know, after the WH, you know, the big article and all that, we're not sure, but the bottom line is we know estrogen affects so many parts of a woman's health. And um, we wanna be able to support women through the perimenopausal period, um, hopefully systemically, but I just don't know, um, you know where we're gonna be. I would certainly take estrogen if I could to stay younger and feel better, 100%. Absolutely, wow. So many pearls. I, I it's just like this has been a, a podcast of a pearl necklace. <laughs> so <laughs> many. <laughs> it's a lot. We could talk forever. I love talking to you. You're so thank you. So understanding. Thank you. You are so full of amazing practical knowledge that people that are in the fertile life world, which you know, my podcast is not only about fertility, it's about things that involve anyone who is in their reproductive years and has a life and has kids and who has other issues other than fertility. So I appreciate you coming on. I love talking to you. You are amazing. Congratulations on one year. Happy birthday to the entire Thank line. You. I Thank can't you. wait for the next line. I am going to be looking in the mail for a small little gift box or bag with a couple of the things. I don't know if it's going to be estrogen under my I, eyes. You know what I'm going to do? <laughs> I'm going to send you, so I will send you my Dr. Zenovia skincare line, the full kit and caboodle, and I'll put some stuff in there for your kids too that might be growing a pimple here and there. And, and then we're there. I, we're there with a 12 and a half year old. Okay. And it's, we're to, there. Okay. I'm going to give it to you. They will love it. And then I will also send you my prototype of my vitamin C, which I think is going to be gangbusters. So Can't wait. Yeah. And I'll wait. Okay. You. So the second you have that one out, I want you to let me know. Okay. And we're going to talk about it and congratulations on that. Thank and thank you, you again. You can, you can find my products at Sephora.com, but Shaheen, I would love to talk to you anytime. Thank you for joining, for inviting me. This was awesome. Uh, thank you. Wait, wait, we're not done. So 
talk, I want you to tell everyone where they can find the products. And I also want everyone to know where they can find you and follow you and learn about all of the wisdom that you have to offer. Got it. Okay. So basically my products are sold at Sephora.com or at drzenovia.com. And you can find me on Instagram or TikTok at drzenovia. And um, yeah, that's it. And my practice is called Xena Medical in Newport Beach, California. And my handle is xenamedical.com. So, so when are you opening the West Side office? Oh my God, you're so sweet. I've been hit up on that so many times. And you know, it's like, I still have kids. I want to be a mom. So it's like my profession is a huge part of who I am, but my family is just, it's, it's so important to me. I can't. Family number one, family yes, number one. For sure. I love for it. Sure. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you everybody for listening and everybody have a wonderful day. What a great talk. Thank you. Bye, everybody.